continue the series we've been on for a number of weeks, and hopefully you've been here throughout the process of this journey. If not, I recommend you get online and get caught up that way if that works for you. Uh, we keep them on there. They're real easy to find on our webpage. Uh, you can just find the messages, get caught up. But I've been talking about one of the favorite stories of mine in the Bible. I've got many. I'm sure you do as well. But it's the story of Jacob and the one thing I find out time and again in the Old Testament in particular, you see some of it in the New, certainly, but the New Testament really shows us what Jesus did for us. But in the Old Testament, it speaks of you and I and our humanity. And, and I think there's a great deal to learn in the Old Testament about the old man, that yes, I've been crucified, but how many know sometimes it don't feel that way? Hello, somebody. I think I got the right group in here. Say, I've been crucified with Christ, and you're like, I'm sick and tired of getting out on this cross. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Lighten up in this church. All right. But I think when we look back in those stories, it gives me hope. I hope it gives you hope as well. Yeah. Because God was faithful, and you see it all through Scripture, but we started out that way in the beginning, and we sang all about his faithfulness all morning. But when I look at these stories in the Old Testament, it speaks of one thing, his covenant. His promise to Abraham, Isaac, and of course, Jacob. And then you and I are grafted in through a man named Jesus. Maybe you know him. And it's the promise that God made of his faithfulness. Say faithful. faithful. And so I love this story, of course, Jacob and Esau. Maybe you know the story already. We just kind of subtitled it, The Saga of Harry and Heel. <laughs> Esau meant red, Harry. So we called him Harry. Jacob, of course, was a heel grabber. And could I have an usher close those doors, please? Would that be possible? Thank you. But really, it was prophesied, even in his mother's womb, that he would grab the heel, thus his name Jacob, and exalt himself, and that his older brother would serve him, the younger. And so we see in the life of Jacob... Up to this point, it's all been about his conniving, him and his mother together. His brother Esau sells him his birthright, not valuing it. That's on Esau. But then Jacob and his mother, they steal the blessing of the father. And we studied that over the past few weeks. And as you can imagine, Esau, because of that act, it says this in Genesis 27. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother, Jacob. This is kind of where we left. Jacob has to leave. Becomes an exile of his own family. And on his journey, something happens. Perhaps you know the story. It's referred to as Jacob's ladder. Let's read Genesis 28. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of those stones that, of that place, and he put it on his head, and he lay down in the place to sleep. Of course, here we see in our story that there's a ladder that extends from earth to heaven, angels moving back and forth back and forth. But the highlight of this story, make no mistake, is not the angels, it's Yahweh himself who appears to Jacob in this time when he's finally asleep, not conniving, not making things happen in his own strength. And here's Jacob, we've looked at him, his character is not the greatest. He's stolen from his brother. Has to move and Yahweh shows up in many translations, and I believe to be true, says Yahweh was not way up there detached, but he was beside Jacob. He was there in the now. And because of Jacob's past, you would sure think that God was going to give him a scolding. It's like, what do you think you were doing? But you know, that's not what God does. That's not what God does. And we left this last week. I just want to catch you up. And behold, the Lord stood above it or beside and said, I am the God of Abraham. Somebody say, I. I. Your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I. Somebody say, I. I. Will give you to you and your descendants also. Your descendants shall be the dust as the dust of the earth. 
You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I, come on, somebody say I. I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I, come on, will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And perhaps you're in a place today and you feel you deserve discipline. And certainly discipline is required in our lives and the Lord is, but he disciplines like none other. And I think many times people who try to teach us about discipline of the Lord really don't understand him very well. He can correct like no other with compassion and love. But the thing I've always noticed about God, not only in the stories in the Old Testament, but in my own life, once I finally got it, and I'm still on a journey, I haven't arrived. I should say, once I finally get in it, is that God always reminds me not of my difficulty, not of my shortcoming, not of my sin. And we all need forgiveness. How many know that? But God will always remind me of his promises. His promises. 1 Corinthians, it tells us that old things pass away in Jesus. All things become new. So that's the promise of God. He doesn't even see your sin as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't see it. It's necessary to confess our sin, to find someone that we can confide in. The Bible teaches us to do so. But God forgives us the minute we ask of all our sins, past, present, future. I know that sounds amazing. Some people may disagree with that, but I believe it to be true. Confession is still good, keeps our hearts right, keeps us on track, because how many know we live in this flesh and blood vessel and it's a mess, all right? And it's our biggest enemy, if you will. So confession is good, but you know, God, once he forgives you in Christ, he doesn't see you, the person. He sees Jesus. He sees his promise to a lost world God so loved the world that he what gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would call on the name of the Lord would be saved. I will never forget that moment from 32 years ago. Perhaps you remember, maybe it was last week or 10 years ago, 50 years ago. I don't know your story. But all who call upon him, and, and I see it in the Old Testament, that God always points to his faithfulness. So let's get back to our story. So now Jacob, he journeys. He's going to spend some time with his uncle. And we'll find out his uncle's a knucklehead too, but that's what Jacob deserves, honestly. And you know, you reap what you sow. Come on, somebody. That doesn't say anything about God's goodness because God's always good. But our actions reap rewards or not <laughs> rewards. But God's faithful no matter what. We can't forget that, but... So it was true with Jacob. He goes, as his mother and father instructed him, to look for a wife from the house of Laban. And let's read on in verse 10 of 29. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Now, you, first service, I got a chuckle. So I'll try it again, as I really don't know how he wept. But I imagine he kisses Rachel and he goes, ah! Is that better than first? I don't know. It says he cried aloud. I don't think it was, maybe. But I think it was, ah! And I think for the first time in our story, I think you'll find this to be true. It's as if Jacob actually has some feelings. Can you imagine that, Patty? Feelings. <laughs> Talking about myself, not you. Patty and I have this relationship. We love Pastor Bob so much. No, and we, and, we, and, and they're one in him. So no, you know, no, we really do. They're great friends of ours. Great friends of ours. But the truth is, this story is the first time that we see Jacob actually has feelings. All through the story up to this point, he doesn't care. He doesn't rip about anybody except himself. And here it's almost as if he's like, finally, I have something that's mine. Something I don't have to try and connive. And for some reason, Jacob and many of us, the Bible says, 
in Proverbs that a man twists his way and his heart frets against the Lord. And I think that's so many of us true for our story. We twist our way and then we fret against God. And listen, life has enough problems without us making more. So get his plan. But here's Jacob. It's finally like, yeah, I haven't had to steal something. I haven't had to try to put myself first because that's what he thought. Even though it was prophesied, he still tried to make it happen. We talked about that last week or the week before. Don't help God out. God can take care of it. Don't, don't you help. You know, you help God out on your knees praying and believing. <laughs> okay. Don't, don't, don't make things happen for God. So he has gratitude. It erupts from the inside of him. His journey's over. He's safe. Verse 15, it says, And Laban said to Jacob, Because you're my relative, should I therefore sit, should you then serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love that he had for her. And again, we see Jacob actually has feelings. He's now serving, not necessarily for himself. Certainly there's a benefit in obtaining a wife, but he's serving someone else. Serving Laban. Not just to get, but serving. And the Bible says it was almost like a dream or the time didn't take very long. It went quickly. Now let's move ahead seven years because the Bible really, it does that. As you read on, it gives us a pretty snapshot. So you got to kind of look between the lines a little. It says, And Laban gathered together all the men of the place. It's the day of the wedding. And made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to jail. Le- what? Wait a minute. Something's up. Somebody say something's up. All right. He brought her to Jacob and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Every time I read this this story, help me out here. I mean, it's like, was the tent that dark? (laughs) He served seven years for the woman of his dreams. And he didn't, how much did he drink at that wedding? (laughs) But anyway, it's our story. (laughs) See, this, and you thought your family was bad. That's what I love about the Old Testament. It's like, there's hope. But of all the things, and boy, how the tables have turned. The one who deceives and steals from his younger brother has now been deceived by the older sister pretending to be the woman he wanted to marry. How the tables have turned. And so here we are. He says, what is this you've done to me? Now, listen, I realize most of us, probably all, are not going to face this on the morning of our wedding night, okay, or after our wedding night. It's just, this is not, I don't know about you, I don't know anybody this happened to. But it's in the Bible, it's true. And I believe it. (laughs) And we may not face this. And maybe you're not even married, but if you are married, I think there comes a point where you're like, what have you done to me? I mean, I think about women. (laughs) First of all, I don't know what a woman sees in a man. That thinks he's attractive. I don't get it. It's like it might as well be a horse or a cow or a donkey. I, you know. But thank God, women are attracted to us. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> they got this guy who does everything in the world to capture her heart. I've done quite a number of weddings, and you know, somebody said this once, and I thought it was funny and, and probably true. Is at some point in the wedding we say, I do or I will. And I think for the guy, he says, I quit. I got her 
I'm moving on to something else. And, and that may not be, but, you know, and at some point, the missus says, what have you done to me? Now, you may not say it to your spouse, or you may be single. Maybe someone wronged you. Maybe you say it to God, what have you done to me? If you haven't had one of those moments in life, well, you said to God, what is this? What have you done? You haven't lived long enough. Yes. So we'll all face it. Now listen, God can handle your anger. Just don't stay there because he is your only friend, really. And you don't want to stay angry at God, but he can handle your problem. He can handle your pain and frustration. Better to take it to him than take it out on somebody else. Come on, somebody, help me out. Or maybe yourself. Maybe you look at yourself and you say, what have I done to me? I know I've had my bouts with this. Maybe you have. Get up in the morning, brush my teeth, shave my head. <laughs> look in the mirror and say, what have you done with your life? You ever been there? And you know, sometimes we can be our greatest enemy. I already said that. Some of the things we think about ourselves, can we be real this morning? Some of the things we say about our mistakes, our shortcomings, and we hate ourselves. And whether you're single or married, let me assure you of something. Jesus made it pretty simple. Man wanted to be his disciple. He comes trying to prove himself to the rabbi. He says, what's the greatest commandment of all? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your brother as yourself. If you do this, you'll keep all the commandments. Think about that. First of all, you got to love God. Secondly, you need to love other people, and in the process, God will teach you how to love yourself. But if you don't love yourself, you won't be able to love others, and you won't love God. In fact, in the book of uh, John's epistle, it says that when you say you love God who you don't see, but don't love man who you do see, that you're a liar. I know I've had people say, I don't need the church. I don't need the church. You know, we're, just, we're fine on our own. Just me and Jesus. No, you're not fine. You're hurt. You're wounded. You don't want to be around people because of the pain. Come on. Let's be real. But that's what being a disciple is all about. Fleshing it out. <laughs> Learn how to love other people. My goodness, people try to love you. The least you can do is get on this bandwagon. <laughs> say there's just so love so hard to love have you looked at your life <laughs> oh I'm easy to love oh. okay we'll find out when you get married if you do how easy you are to love <laughs> see now my wife Trish is easy to love I gotta say that it's amazing it really is not as easy to love as I am because I just I get along with everybody but she's close second. <laughs> what is this you've done to me? Let's talk about marriage for a moment. I know some of us are single. Let me just ask you this. How many are married or even were married? Maybe you're divorced because, you know, God loves you. Okay? Being divorced isn't, doesn't, is not the unforgivable sin. But you've either been married, are married, or want to be married. Lift your hand. It's most of us. Some of you sitting with a couple. <laughs> I say, do you want to be married? And you're like, no. No, hey, don't lift your hand if I say that. No. But the truth is, some of us may not be. But let's just look at marriage, because many people do get married. And I believe that God is saying... I am giving you this co-sinner. Someone that I can work out my salvation in your life through. And you're like, thanks, Pastor. Now, that may not be on a Hallmark card. <laughs> but it's true. Is I really think that marriage and life in general, but marriage, just to speak to husbands and wives for a moment, that's what sacrificial love is all about. Sometimes we think, well, you know, once I get married, all my problems go away. Oh, you mean just like Jacob's did? <laughs> oh, his problems are just starting. We gotta, we're going to get a little ways this morning. 
It's a mess, y'all. It's a mess. And you don't need to explain how great marriage is when you're on cloud nine of wedded bliss. But after about the first two years, come on, let's, let's be honest. You're like, what have you done to me? You got to work. Somebody say work. How many, love is work. Love is a choice. And you know, you've heard it. It's not a feel. Well, you know, I'm just not in love with them anymore. Well, you better turn yourself around because you said I do. Well, I, we just don't have what we had before. I know. But if you start to love, you can make it better than it used to be. Come on, somebody ought to shout. You've been married a while. You know it's true. It can be better. Or maybe you went through a divorce. Look, I understand. It's hard. And I like these messy families because, you know, Trish and I, we both come from divorced homes. I've been divorced. Both of us have dealt with addiction of some type as well as abuse, verbal, physical. I don't know what your story is, but life is rough. But God is good. God is good. So not all of marriage or life, for that matter, is dessert. Sometimes it's the things we need to eat that we don't like that are the healthiest for us. And the truth is we've inherited this birth defect from Adam and Eve. <laughs> I don't do this often, but I thought this was a great word. You're going to hear me speak Latin. You can say, our pastor spoke Latin in church today, and you can feel, go impress your friends. Okay. The Latin name is this, incurvatus in se. Doesn't that sound good? Incurvatus in se. This is what it means. Curved in on oneself. <laughs> so what does that mean, pastor? Try to make a toddler do what he don't want to do. That's incurvatus in se. I want what I want when I want it. And even though it's not a learn, something like that. Incurvatus in se. There you go. And even though we don't have to learn it, some of us are pretty good at continuing to get pretty much better at it. Oh, we may not throw ourselves on the ground. We may not stomp and kick on the outside. But make no mistake about it, we want our way. We want what we want when we want it. And it's hard to love. In fact, it's hard to exist in life, let alone marriage, when we want everything our way. And we will end up damaging ourselves as well as others. And 1 Corinthians, I know you've read this. It's pretty common at, at weddings. And I realize it's speaking of God's love, but listen, this is for all of us. Understand the context. Paul the Apostle is teaching on spiritual gifts. And right between chapter 12 and 14, if you will, he says there's a better way. Don't lean on the gift. Oh, embrace the gifts, and we do. All of them. Healing, miracles, signs and wonders. But right in the middle, he says, I'll show you a better way. And look what he writes. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not just in marriage. This is life. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. Oh, awful silent in here. It does not rejoice in iniquity. You just love it when you get the dirt on somebody else. Come on. Let's move on. But rejoices in the truth. Oh, they finally got theirs. I, I've heard people scream at the top of their lungs, I want truth. No, you want to fight. You don't want truth. You want your truth. Bears all things. How about that? Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. He says, well, there's prophecies, they'll fail. Every spiritual gift will fail, but he says, love never fails. Somebody say choices. These are the choices we get to make in life. Choose love. Choose to love others. 
In marriage, it's certainly true. Letting the other people see your faults. Oh, my goodness. But you know, whether married or single, life has valleys. Places where we cry out, why? What the? Oh, here's, here's, here's a common one. How long? I love how we love suffers long. Well, how long is long enough? Longer than you've been suffering. And I know it's not a laughing matter, especially if we suffer from things mentally, physically. But you know, we just got to not give up on God, no matter what. But certainly in relationships, suffering long with one another. Why? What? How long? First Peter 4 says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, not just in marriage. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We minister to one another through what? Love. Love serves. Love serves. Jesus said, Greater love has no man than lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus was an example. If you want to know what love is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It's hard to put ourselves on a cross. I mean, we all want to put everybody else up there. Come on. Get them. That's not, that's not what love does. I just had something ever since worship started. I'm like, do I share it? Do I share it? Um, I'm not going to read the scripture, but it's Luke 7. I believe it's verse 47. And in this chapter, it was talking about the woman who was an adulterous woman. And Jesus was in a house meeting with people. And the whole time, she's just on the ground before him at her feet and just washing his feet with her tears and her hair and um, just, you know, that is an act of love, an act of worship, an act of what someone would look at like, what's wrong with this person? They look foolish. Why are they doing this? You know, and, and it just really hit me when Jesus said, you know, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. You know, he said to the host of the house, when, when I came in, you didn't even offer me a drink. But here she sat at my feet, washing my feet with her tears, just serving him, looking foolish. But she didn't care. And he said, go, your sins are forgiven. And the thing that really stuck out to me was when he said, those whose sins are many those who are forgiven much, love much. And when we can get that revelation, it makes forgiveness a little bit easier, <laughs> right? Because we realize how much he's forgiven us. And I know I've been that place. I've been that adulterous woman. It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical adultery. It's just anything that's an idol before God that I've put in front of him. I have committed adultery before God. And then we lay, at our, we lay at his feet and realize how much he has forgiven us, how much more we can love and forgive. And I just thought that was a beautiful picture. Thank you. That's awesome. How many know our story? This was kind of unplanned, unwanted. But it's the unplanned, unwanted things in life where I think God does his greatest work. I mean, really. I don't know what your unplanned or unwanted thing is in your life, and it's probably not fun, but I know that it's a place that God can show himself faithful. In marriage, let me just say this. You did not marry the wrong person. Stay married. Work on it. So I think about this story. If it wasn't for Leah, and certainly Jacob had not planned on marrying her, then Leah never would have given birth to Judah. If Judah hadn't been born, there'd be no tribe of Judah. Come on, somebody. 
If there hadn't been any tribe of Judah, we wouldn't have had Boaz, we wouldn't have had Jesse, we wouldn't have had David, we wouldn't have had a young virgin girl named Mary who gave birth to the hope of the world. In these unplanned things, again, I don't know what your unplanned or unwanted thing is, God can work a great thing. Why? He's faithful. He is faithful. Don't give up. Don't quit. In fact, I think that if Jacob would have known what God was up to and what he would do through Leah's life and his marriage to Leah, not to mention Rachel as well, but we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> Say weird. The story's weird, man. It's weird. Okay. But I think if he would have known... Rather than leap for joy and weep for joy. Ah, remember that back in the day. For Rachel, I think he would have looked at Leah and went, woo because of what God did. Because it was through her lineage that Jesus, the hope of the world, was born. So, somebody say weird. And Laban said, it must not be done in our country to give younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week. And we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me yet another seven years. Oh, my. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. He gave his daughter Rachel, his wife also, and Laban gave his maid Bilhah and to his daughter Rachel as a maid. Somebody say weird. So he served seven years for the wife he didn't want, seven years for the wife he does want, and he gets... A maid or two thrown in. The story's it's weird. It's amazing what God will accomplish through flesh and blood if we'll let him. And in this story, I think the Old Testament, and I mentioned up front, I love the Old Testament for this reason. It is full of gross unholiness. Say, <laughs> so, well, that's weird. No, it, it sh- it, God is faithful in a bunch of weird stuff. I mean, you think about it. <laughs> We have brothers murdering brothers. Cain and Abel, we were talked about that way back in the beginning. We have brothers deceiving another brother, selling him into slavery. Joseph, you may know the story. We got Noah. All right, remember Noah in the ark? After the flood, he's so drunk, he's laying naked in the floor of his tent. It is weird. It's weird, and then some weird stuff happens. We're not going to get into that. Then we have three patriarchs, or two of the three patriarchs, rather, that lie about their wives being their sister to save their own skin. Abraham, when he did it, gets rich off the lie. But God still promises to Abraham. I'm not telling you to lie to get rich, but there's hope for you. If if there's hope for them, there's hope for you and me. We've got, think about this. There's a son who has sex with his half-brother's mother. That's Reuben, by the way. That's one of Jacob's, Jacob's sons. Sleeps with one of his half-brother's mothers. Weird. We got a daughter-in-law dresses up like a prostitute to sleep with a John who is the father of both of her dead husbands. I mean, it is weird. We're not even out of Genesis yet. He still got... You got first and second Samuel. You got. Oh, oh my gosh. There's hope for us. There really is. I believe that. Look at this blessing in Ruth 4. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah are praised. Why? The two who built the house of Israel. See how God looks at it? They built my house. And I think that's what God is doing through our lives. Building his house on a foundation that cannot be shaken. It says in Jacob, verse 30, also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah and served with Laban still another seven years. It's interesting to me. It says he loved Rachel more than Leah, but he didn't, I didn't keep him away from Leah's bed, y'all. <laughs> it's like, well, I, I'll sleep with her too. It's fine. I love Rachel, but hey. 
And, and, and Leah has babies, three, four total, but three to this point. Rachel is barren to this point. And Leah, finally, with her fourth child, her heart's cry is, maybe my husband will finally love me. She's given him three sons, and she looks at her life, and maybe someplace in your life you feel like, boy, if I just do this one more act of kindness. Maybe you're in a marriage where you think, boy, if I just do this right. Maybe you're in an abusive relationship. Well, if I just do this one more time, maybe they'll love me. Again, the Bible's real. So she's like, maybe my husband will finally love me. And the Bible says, with her fourth child, she conceived again, and she named him Judah. And then she stopped bearing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And we could go on and on. But Rachel, she's pretty much just, give me babies or bury me. Give me babies or kill me. And finally, the Lord helps her to conceive. And the thing that's weirder, and somebody say weird in this story, is now it turns into this like gold medal race for who can have the most kids. <laughs> Rachel, Leah, oh, we're just going to throw in the handmaids, go ahead and sleep with them too. And, you know, Jacob's got his own mini little harem there. I mean, it's kind of like, somebody say weird. It's weird. It's weird. At the end of the competition, <laughs> Rachel's given breath, breath. Rachel's well breath. Rachel's given birth to one son, Joseph. Okay. Leah has six sons and one daughter. Bilhah has two sons, and Zilpah has two sons. These names are crazy. Somebody say weird, okay. Has two sons. All of those combined give us the tribes of Israel, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. Of course, the daughter, Dinah. And then finally, when in our story we'll get there in a few weeks, Jacob is reunited with his brother and father. Rachel has her final son, and his name is Benjamin. And all through this story, what it helps me realize is in a funky funk, God is faithful. God is faithful. Here's what I want you to do. I already mentioned Trish and I come from backgrounds that are, you know, God's done a lot of healing. I, I, in our marriage, we were first married. Boy, we needed, some, we needed some help. We were messed up. Like I said, I was married, divorced, multiple relationships even outside of marriage and Trish the same and then trying to figure this thing out. We need help. We all need help. I want you to look to the person next to you or just look around. Look behind you. Look in front of you. Boy, some of you all laughing at me. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. What is this? God building his church. All of us with our past, with our presence, but our future, if we'll let him, is in the hands of God. He is building, 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 1 Corinthians 6, and such were some of you. Liars, cheats, adulterers, adulteresses. But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You say, well, yeah, he was talking about the Corinthian church. Have you read about the Corinthian church? They were just as messed up. They, they were not doing church right. But by the Spirit of God, Paul writes, such were some of you. And we need to see one another in the light of the way God sees us and them. Such were some of you, we've been sanctified. And I said this earlier, but I want to read it again, Matthew 11. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Maybe you're frustrated like Rachel. Maybe you're bitter like Leah. Maybe you feel used 
like the two mates. Well, this morning the Lord says, come. And I love the way the end of this book, the Bible, ends. One of the passages I love so much says this. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who is here say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Would you come and drink this morning? Maybe God needs to work in your marriage. Maybe you haven't seen his promises come to pass yet. That's hard. But God's faithful. Some of us today, we've got to forgive God. We've got to forgive ourselves. Most of us, probably all, have to forgive somebody else along the way. But here's the thing. If we don't forgive other people, it hinders our growth. Oh, we're still forgiven. God still loves us. God still sees us in light of Jesus. But it affects our relationships and our lives from here forward. Forgiveness will cover a multitude of sin. Love will cover a multitude of sin. So just pray this with me. You think about your situation. Maybe it's yourself, maybe it's God, maybe it's another. Say, God, today I choose forgiveness. I choose love. I will love you with all my heart, all my soul, and I will love my brother and myself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now look this way. If you need further prayer, our prayer team is here. If you want to know what it means, listen, to accept Christ as your Savior, our prayer team can help you with that. Praying a prayer is part of it. Going to church is good, but it's not about being a member of this church or any church for that matter. When you say yes to Jesus, you're part of the church. But there's some things we want you to know about salvation. And so if you want to know about Jesus, you want to make him Lord of your life, or maybe you've been away from him and you want to come back, please come forward. We've got information we'll share with you. We'll pray with you. If you need prayer for anything else, please come forward as well. One other thing quick, and then we'll dismiss. In a couple of weeks, August 13th, it's our family church picnic. Every year we do it. It's so much fun. We need to know how much food to prepare, so sign up online. You can go to our website, getreallife.info, or there's a couple of scan codes in the foyer. You can just stick your phone on there like you do so many other restaurants, places we frequent, and it'll take you to the website. Sign up. We just want to know how you and your family so we can prepare. The other thing is we have eight or nine people being baptized in water already. It's awesome. And, and so we, we want to make room for you. If you have not, listen, if you have not been water baptized since you believed, maybe you be, became a believer today. I hope so. But water baptism, even though it doesn't save you, it's your prayer and faith in Jesus that saves you. Baptism is an act of obedience. And every time we do something obediently by faith, there's a blessing. And I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in so many others. Maybe you were baptized as a child. But you haven't been water baptized since you became a believer. The and, you know, baby, we do dedications. I understand baptisms. But the thing is, the Bible says believe and be baptized. There has to be a belief first. And so I believe that if you become a believer in your adult life and you were baptized as a baby, an infant, I think that you need to be baptized. I think it'll, and here's why. I'm not saying you're not saved, but it will make a big difference in your life. I guarantee you. Some of the stuff you've had a challenge with, living for Christ, will fall off. I guarantee you. And you'll feel like you drank of that water. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.